The Logic of God by Ravi Zacharias Narration and Discussion Chapter 2 The Ultimate Calling 1 Peter chapter 3, 8-9, through 9, and 15-16 through 16. Be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. In your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. A starting point for taking on the responsibility of the work of Christian apologetics is recognizing the role that living out a disciplined Christian life plays. Even a brief examination of the scripture reveals this striking imperative. One may not divorce the content of apologetics from the character of the apologist. Apologetics derives from the Greek word apologia, which means to give an answer. 1 Peter 3.15 gives us the defining statement, In your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer, apologia, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. I have always found this to be such a fascinating verse because the Apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew the hazards and the risks of being an answer-bearer to the sincere questions people would pose of the gospel. Indeed, when one contrasts the answers of Jesus to those of any of his detractors, it is easy to see that their resistance is not of the mind, but rather of the heart. Furthermore, I have little doubt that the single greatest obstacle to the impact of the gospel has not been its inability to provide answers, but the failure on our parts to live it out. The British evangelist Rodney Gipsy Smith once said, There are five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the Christian. But most people will never read the first four. In other words, apologetics is often first seen before it is heard. For that reason, the scripture gives us a clear picture of the apologetic Christian, one who has first set apart Christ in his or her heart as Lord who responds with the answers to the questions with gentleness and respect. Therefore, one must not overlook the stark reality that the way one's life is lived out will determine the impact. Few obstacles to faith are as serious as expounding the unlived life. Too many people see the quality of one's life and firmly believe that it is all theory bearing no supernatural component. I remember well in the early days of my Christian faith, talking to a Hindu man. He was questioning the strident claims of the followers of Christ as being something supernatural. He absolutely insisted conversion was nothing more than a decision to lead a more ethical life, and that in most cases it was not any different to those claims of other ethical religions. So far, his argument was not anything new. But then he said something I have never forgotten and often reflect upon. If this conversion is truly spiritual, why is it not more evident in the lives of so many Christians I know? This question is a troublesome one. After all, no Buddhist claims a supernatural life but frequently lives a more consistent one. The same pertains to many of the other faiths. Yet how often the so-called Christian, even while proclaiming some of the loftiest truths one could ever express, lives a life bereft of that beauty and character. This call to a life reflecting the person of Christ is the ultimate calling upon the apologist. Skeptics are not slow to notice when there is a disparity and because of that may question the whole gospel and its supernatural claim. Yet when they are met with gentleness and respect, he will help meet the deepest longings of the heart and the mind. And they will find where true discovery lies. Let us live so accordingly. 
That was chapter 2 of Ravi Zacharias' book, The Logic of God. Now, you can probably hear the crickets chirping outside over the microphone. I apologize for that. I'm not scripted right now. I haven't even looked over this beforehand. I just picked up a book and went for it. But the first reflection question that is given here says, What does it look like to revere Christ as Lord? Why does Peter begin this charge with this injunction? And quite honestly, I feel like I could probably talk about that one point for <laughs> 30 minutes or so. To revere Christ as Lord. What does that look like? I think to understand that fully and really to paint a picture, you have to understand what the words mean. Now, obviously, we're talking about Christ, and to to revere is to uh, acknowledge, basically. So, to acknowledge Christ as Lord, Lord, capital L. In history class, we were probably taught that a, a Lord was a person who owned land, you know, back in back in the days of cobblestone streets and castles in Europe, you would have people by the name of Lord, and they would be a elite in the society. But this instance of the word Lord is a much more authoritative version of the word Lord. This is the Holy Lord. This is the Lord God. This is Lord Teacher. This is Lord Savior. The phrase, revere Christ as Lord, is to acknowledge Him for all that He truly is. But not only to acknowledge Him for what He is, or who He is, but also to acknowledge one, one's own self relative to Him. Christ is Lord. We know from John chapter 1 that He was there before the world began. And through him, all things were made and all things consist. And even that is repeated in Ephesians chapter 4. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is God. He is creator. And the creator has an authority over the created. Yet we have free will whether or not we accept that authority or deny that authority. Now the Christian has accepted that authority. If they have not, then... They have not become a Christian. If you shall confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that he raised from the dead, then you shall be saved. But you must first confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and to confess that is to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If it's just empty words spoken, then it's just empty words spoken. And God knows the contents of a person's heart. He knows the genuineness of those words when and if they are spoken. The life which reveres Christ as Lord is a life that is, it's a life that can be easily reflected with the Bible. You could hold the Bible up, uh, take a, a passage from Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 is a good example. I just read it before I started this. It's on my mind fresh. You could hold Ephesians 4 up to a Christian and see the relationship that they have. You could see that in their life because they are actively building their life around the Word of God, around the lifestyle which Jesus Christ calls us to live, which Paul writes about under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, to use Ravi's words, to give us these divine teachings of how this world is supposed to work and how we were meant to live, how we are meant to live. But because of the fall and sin, ultimately, We've moved away from that and into unrighteousness and carnality. But the life which reveres Christ as Lord will not submit to fleshly desires. Now, obviously, they'll make mistakes. They will submit to fleshly desires in a moment of weakness and temptation. Nobody is perfect. Nobody becomes perfect. And the Bible says it itself. The law made nothing perfect. There's no amount of abstinence which will make a human being perfect. That's not the idea. But the life which reveres Christ as Lord, you can see how that life is reflected in Scripture. We were made in the image of God. And it's God's reflection which 
should be shining off of the Christian because the Christian is looking at God and God is light. So if you point a mirror at the light, then there will be a reflection. Why do you think Peter begins his charge with this injunction? I think he does that to express the gravity and the authority of Jesus Christ, of the situation, of what's being said, to express the magnitude of this information. Obviously, we don't have... A, well, we have it. It's it's not here in front of me. I don't read in Greek. I have a concordance which I use to look up Greek words. But this word Lord here, it would be recognized in Greek as being a uh, an authoritative title. So when they read that and they say, "Oh man, this is we have, like he get, he gets the authority, he gets the the attention, he gets the worship, the praise like this is his this is him." He is the preeminent one. They're understanding just exactly who this is. And that's why I think he begins with that charge. It reminds me of when uh, the soldiers came to Jesus wanting to arrest him finally before the crucifixion. And uh, they said, which of you is Jesus? And Jesus said, I am he. And when he said that, you know, mirroring when God told Moses to say, I am his sent you, when Moses spoke with Pharaoh, the soldiers actually fell to the ground. There was just so much power and authority in the name of Jesus, in the words of Jesus, him saying, I am. I'm quite honestly, I've got chills thinking about it. It's, wow. <laughs> and maybe that's unprofessional for me to laugh or, um, I don't know. If it's unprofessional, that'll be all right. This is YouTube. I mean, it's it's a podcast. It's God. I mean, how I don't know how I could be anything but amazed. Anyway, back on to the topic. Reflection question number two. What is the single greatest obstacle to the impact of the gospel? And what is so difficult about expounding the unlived life? Now, those words sound familiar because they were direct quotes from the chapter which we just read. Um, you, you can say these reflection questions are not simply just reflect on your own thoughts, but reflect on what you just read. They're, intention, they're intending you to go back and read again and check out the major points. And as I'm looking for the exact place where, where those words are used... Think about it for yourself. I mean, what is the greatest obstacle to uh, to the impact of the gospel? Now, I'm going to look for it and see if I can find the exact words while I'm talking and I'm multitasking. I'm great at that. But honestly, it it's the people, I think. I think it's the people who live their lives in a lukewarm sense that... They're just a little bit there. They're not fully there. They're not fully committed. And you can't expect Jesus to make something beautiful if you don't give him all of the material, if you don't surrender all. You know, I, I was raised Baptist in a Baptist church, and we sang the song, I Surrender All, a lot. And um, when I was younger, we sang the song, The Potter's Hand, very often. And if I'm the clay and the world has mashed me up into this nasty little wad, then how can I expect Jesus to make something new of my life if I only give him part of the clay, which is myself? I have to give him all of the clay. I have to give him all of myself so that he can make something new. And I have found the, the quote from the chapter. I'll read the, the full sentence. I have little doubt that the single greatest obstacle to the impact of the gospel has not been its inability to provide answers, but the failure on our part to live it out. Which is, in essence, the idea which I was just uh, talking about. The gospel does not lack any strength. It doesn't lack anything at all. It's like uh, the parable of the sower. I preached uh, a sermon with the parable of the sower more than once. I actually spoke at a FCA event. It's a 
future Christian athletes. It's a little organization within the school system. And before this um, pandemic came about, uh, we had a big gathering. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough, blessed enough to preach there. And I preached out of the parable of the sower. And then my youth minister, who is going to speak after me, he said, now if you know anything about Luke chapter 8, I think it was Luke chapter 8, I may be wrong. If you know anything about Luke chapter so-and-so, you know that it's the parable of the sower. And I just sat there in disbelief because the whole idea of preaching the parable of the sower came to me late one night as I was going to bed. And I said, you know, that's the one. That's that's for that day. And it was an amazing little affirmation right there. But the reason I say all that is because in the parable of the sower, there are four different kinds of soil. The sower goes about and he plants seed everywhere. But the only seed which is successful is the seed which is planted on the good, clean soil that doesn't have any thorns or thistles growing up in it. That has the, the depth of the soil to actually cover the seed so that it can grow up. There's no rocks in it. It's not rocky soil. It's not just thrown on top, but it's actually dug down in there. And Jesus later on explains the parable, and we uh, extrapolate information from that. Our hearts are the soil. Jesus has said that the Word of God is the seed. He scatters it everywhere. It goes everywhere. He's not, um, he's not stingy with it. It's everywhere. It's available for anyone. It's up to the person to be the good soil to take in that seed so that good trees could grow up. And in you know, the, the parable of the fruit tree, everything a person says or does comes from the overflow of their heart. The evil man speaks out of the evil storeroom of his heart. The good man speaks out of the good storeroom of his heart. And that storeroom is filled with either good fruit or bad fruit. And the way you produce good or bad fruit depends on what kind of trees you have planted in your heart. And... You know, to, to explain what the heart is, when you translate the word heart in Greek and in Hebrew, it refers to a person's mind. So the deepest part of a person's mind, where you believe. Uh, some scholars would probably even say that the heart is the subconscious mind. But whatever you take in through your eyes and ears, that's what you're planting within yourself. You're filling yourself up with that. And you also pour out with what you fill yourself with. So if you fill yourself up with Scripture, with the Word of God, with these seeds, then you'll see that you pour them out. And in doing so, the issue of uh, the, the life which is not being lived to the, to the accordance of God's Word, that is not living it out, as Ravi says, that issue disappears because you've solved the problem at its source. Now you may say, oh, I don't enjoy reading. Reading's not for me. I don't really like reading the Bible. And that's a hard thing to admit. A friend of mine, a really great minister, really a, an older brother to me in, in the spirit, he's, re, he's really good at what he does. He's really good at preaching and being a minister. He, he told me this story about himself when he was younger. He didn't like to read the Bible. He, he didn't enjoy it. But he read about the prophets who said, when I received your word, I consumed it. Now, obviously, they didn't mean he, they literally ate it and took it into their physical body, but they, they read it and they went through it and they made it a part of themselves. That is, that's what it means to consume the word. They make it a part of themselves. They put it inside themselves, inside their ears, inside their eyes. But he didn't have that kind of desire, but he wanted to have it. We said earlier that everything you do flows from your heart. We know that God can change the heart of man. So what I'm saying is that if you do not enjoy reading the Bible but you want to, pray that God would change the desires of your heart so that you would love to read the Bible more. Pray that God would renew your heart, renew your mind, and make you to be the person which He wants you to be. Because I promise He wants you to read the Bible. If you absolutely hate reading, you can get an audio to listen to it. <laughs> God just wants you to be invested in Him. Because when you're invested in Him, you can be filled up with Him, with His Spirit, with the, the good fruit of His Spirit. 
and then show that to the world. And then people say, oh my goodness, wh where do they get this hope from? And just like Peter says, you can be ready to give that account of why you are so hopeful, just to use the quote the scripture. What is so difficult about expounding the unlived life? Uh, the second part of question two and the reflection questions. I think that the hardest part is that there's not a life that's been lived. The difficulty in expounding the unlived life lies in that there has not been a life lived. And to expound is to look deeper at, to look more closely at. And if you don't have very much to work with, then it's difficult to look closer at it, to pull deeper thoughts and ideas and substances out of it. That's just simple logic. So if a person has not lived their life in this Christian way, in this way of revering, revering Christ as Lord, then they don't have a very deep well to draw from in themselves. The key being in themselves right there. We're not meant to only draw from ourselves. Absolutely not. In fact, in many cases, we're meant to draw from God exclusively. But our own well, our own self, is extremely important also. It's our testimony. We draw from our testimony, and that's where we start. That's our well. That's as deep as our testimony. That's as deep as our well gets, is our testimony and the life that we have lived for Christ. But God makes the well deeper because the entirety of the Bible is the foundation which the well is on. It's the land where the well is planted, and it never goes dry, and it never runs out, and it doesn't have a bottom. And it's one of the most remarkable things in this world. I mean, the entire concept of infinity is mind-boggling in and of itself, but to think that you could... There is an existing grace, love, mercy... Uh, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. To think that there is an inquantifiable amount of these wonderful things, and it is all readily available to any person through prayer or through reading of God's Word, or combination of both, I implore you, combination of both. It's very difficult to live a full Christian life when you're not taken from every food group, you know? But when you pull from every food group, from the prayer and the reading, and you revere Christ as Lord and you live your life in this way, then you don't have to expound an unlived life. But you can expound upon your own life. And even if you are one of those who came to Christ at an older age, or you haven't lived your life for Christ as much as you should, as much as you could have, and you have that uh, maybe regret inside of you, I want to encourage you to think of it differently because if you think of it as, oh no, I messed up, then you're only focusing on yourself and not focusing on the fact that God is there with you, that it's not all about you and your ability. It's not about how strong you are, how much experience you have, but it's about God and what God did out of love and mercy and all of the stories in the Bible. You don't have to draw from your life alone. You can draw from the life of God himself on earth. No one's well is empty, and no one's well is shallow, so long as they have God. They're all infinitely deep. And infin infinity is obviously innumerable. And because it's innumerable, and it's always innumerable, then it's always equal. Personal application, question one. How has your conversion experience made a visible difference in your life and in those around you? Yeah, I could talk for 30 minutes about this one alone, too. <laughs> My life before, um, well, I had a life before knowing Christ, and then I had a life before revering Christ as Lord. I came to know Christ, but I was very young, and I didn't fully understand what in the world was going on, but I knew within myself that it was a decision to follow God that I, that I was saved of Christ's blood. I knew it within myself to be true, although I didn't understand it uh, so much so that I could put it into words myself. I just felt it within my own heart. 
And if you wanted to, you could argue that I didn't understand it all, that if I that if I couldn't explain it or make it known in words, then I, it wasn't real at all. If you want to argue that, you can. I was there. I, <laughs> I think I have a pretty good account of the, the emotional uh, response. And not just the emotional response, but the spirit man that is inside me that we all have being drawn to God. But I, I was very young. I was I was a mean kid. I was mean. I, I tripped my preschool teacher and made it look like an accident. But I, I did it because I wanted to see if she'd actually trip. She didn't fall down. She wasn't hurt or anything. But I was an evil, little, mischievous kid. And uh, if I had not come to know Christ as Lord, then I would be a very, very mean person today. You know, in my my natural man, my carnality, the old man that I need to put off, put away, so that I can be renewed. Uh, you know, Paul talks about the internal struggle. My internal struggle is being compassionate. And I struggle with being compassionate because I, mean, I was a mean kid. I mean, it's not, uh, it doesn't come as naturally for me as some other things do. And uh, it's, it's my particular burden to bear. My conversion experience has, uh, well, it's caused me to have very, very few friends, to be honest. I think of my time as being very valuable, and I don't spend it with just anyone. And there are a few people who, um, unfortunately, few people who I've met about you know my same age with similar interests as I do that I could even be friends with. I don't live the same life that, uh, say, other Gentiles do. Because <laughs> I, I came to know God, and I applied it to my life very uh, liberally. And take in as much as God will give out. I try to. I fail. I'm human. But the truth is that uh, God is always, God is always here with us. But are you going to be here with God? Where are your thoughts? Where are your actions? And as I had my conversion experience, to quote the book, my life changed. I said different words. I did different things. I talked to different people. And even though by any means of logical reasoning, I should have been unhappy, walking down the hallway in the high school, knowing that God has everything under control, that God has caused for me to be saved, that I'm essentially immortal, <laughs> and that all things work out for the good of those who love God, those called according to His purpose, that I'm not really alone, even if I do feel alone. There's just a peace in that. There was a peace in that. And there was a joy in knowing Christ. And in that whole prospect of thinking, I felt like I was walking down a hallway full of light. Even if it, even if we probably did break every fire code every day because there were so many kids in the hallway, it's it's an experience that is difficult to describe at times. Personal application: What might you do this week to become a more effective witness for Christ? Now remember at the beginning, Peter, the scripture from Peter saying that we should always be ready to give an account as to why we are so hopeful. And I think that knowing Scripture, being able to quote Scripture, is very, very, very important for that. Because not only does it show uh, the unbeliever or the questioner that you are sincere and committed and that you have spent time in the Bible, but it, it, it fills a gap in the human heart that is only God-shaped. Only God can fill that hole. There's a God-shaped hole in everyone's heart, and it has to be refilled. Jesus said, uh, anyone who wishes to follow me must take up their cross daily and then come after me. Deny themselves, take up their cross daily, then come after me. Daily. It's a daily pursuing of Jesus Christ, of God. And we go to meet him. We go and meet Jesus Christ in our prayer and in our study of the Bible, and in our worship, and, you know, study and prayer, that is worship, but also in spoken worship, in preaching, 
and speaking and leading small group discussion or um, singing or dancing. Now, I'm not one to dance, well, not very well, but <laughs> even David, he danced before the Lord in joy and happiness. And the people were like, oh my gosh, David has lost his mind. But that wasn't the case at all. David humbled himself like a child in the presence of God. To think that as grown people, we could feel so free and unburdened as a child does. Knowing the evils that are in this world, understanding the struggles and the hardship, but the compassion and the peace and the grace that Jesus Christ provides, that a relationship with Him provides, could so relieve those things, could so renew a person's outlook on the world, that they could be humbled like a child again. That's a remarkable prospect in and of itself. And again, could probably talk for another 30 minutes about that alone. Uh, My chair is squeaking, I'm sorry. But those are all the reflection questions and personal application questions. This has been Chapter 2 of The Logic of God by Robbie Zacharias. I want to say I'm sorry for taking so long in between episodes. Uh, College schedule and making a schedule and everything is crazy. But um, the more I think about this YouTube thing and putting Bible-based content out into the world, the more I realize that not everybody gets into their Bible, but more people get on YouTube. And if God can find them on YouTube through some little piece that I made, what a blessing that would be. And not, not for me, obviously, but wow. It's... I hope that one day in the future that somebody would meet me and I might even be recognized in public and they would say, I came to know Christ as Lord because of one of your videos. You led me to Christ. (laughs) To which I would say, dude, I didn't do anything. I just did what God led me to do. He gets all the credit, all the glory. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. I simply spoke the word which God had already said. Uh, This video is some 30 minutes long, long long-form content. Listen to it on your way to work while you get ready for school, while you get ready for work, whatever it is that you may be doing. I hope you enjoyed this audio video thingamabop. Um, Very soon, I hope, I may bulk record all of these and just upload them over a period of a few weeks. And read the whole book all at once. I'll really scramble my brain. <laughs> but again, without without any more rambling, thank you very much for listening. And if you listen to this whole thing, God bless you. I, I praise, <laughs> thank you. Uh, YouTube is such a crazy place. Maybe someday, a few years from now, there'll be several people who listen to this all the way through. But I digress. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you enjoy this series and move on to chapter three. It's coming out very soon, if not already. Thank you, and good night.